My name is Eric Pryor. I'm the president and CEO here at PAFA, and we are just elated uh, to have this night here, finally, uh, and have all of you in attendance tonight. Uh, tonight, we're here to celebrate Rising Sun, artists in an uncertain America. And I don't know, many of you I saw last night, uh, if you weren't there last night, uh, you really missed a spectacular opening at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. And I just want to acknowledge Dr. Jordan and her entire team. Let's give them a Somebody told me, I won't say who, but they said they set a high bar last night, Eric. So, so I said, well, tell me if we reach it. And they said, don't worry, I will. So I'm looking forward to that. But this is really, you know, when we came together, this show, 20 artists, two, muse uh, two museums, one exhibition. Uh, and when I came here, it was one of the things that I learned about very early was that we had this extremely ambitious exhibition called Rising Sun and they shared a few things with me, budget and a lot of other things about the exhibit and it was an eye-opener and you know you, you and then very shortly after that I had the opportunity to meet one of our major funders and it was so clear uh, how committed the Pew was to this exhibition and when I had the opportunity to meet Paula one of the first things that she wanted to know was, was I committed to supporting this exhibition and wanted to really underscore how important they felt it was that we work together, that this wasn't two separate exhibitions, that this was one effort in which uh, came across as seamless. And I just really, I just wanted to start the evening there and really just underscore how important that was to them. And I was just sharing uh, with Paula earlier that, you know, the, uh, that, you know, I gained a sister in it for those who were there last night and Dr. Jordan, because uh, it really, it struck me that I needed to know the leader at AMP and Dr. Jordan is new and, I, and I'm new here. Uh, and we, you know, got to know one another. She got to meet my wife and they become, they talk now, and I hear, you know, I, she finds out things that's happening in Philly from Dr. Jordan before she hears them from me. So that, that's just how that relationship grew. So I want to thank you for that. It's so important. And so those of you who have not made it over to AMP, if you don't know the address, it's at 701 Art Street. And I want to just encourage all of you to make certain that you get over there. The other thing I want to just uh, say this evening that we're extremely lucky. When I was there last night, one of the things that helped me know that this is a seamless effort was how many of the artists that are exhibiting works here were at the opening and at the talk last night. And I see the same thing here. So a number of the artists are in the room. You can either wave your hands in the air or you can stand up, whatever you want to do. But if you could raise your hand, please, the exhibiting artists. Uh, I'm not going to take the curator's thunder. They will be uh, introducing the artist by name and saying a bit more, so I, I'm going to leave that one alone. Uh, but also, I want to just say we are so lucky uh, to have been working with our colleagues at AMP. Uh, I, w once again, Dr. Jordan, the president and CEO of AMP, and then also DJ Duckett, uh, the uh, curator, the Director of Curatorial Services at AMP. Thank you both. And I know many of the uh, AMP staff are here. If any of their staff is here, if you could raise your hands. <laughs> and of course, I, you know, I can't stand up here and not acknowledge uh, the team at PAFA. Uh, the, the, just the lift that this has been, has been, I can't underscore just how big of an undertaking this has been. It, it's a really, really uh, important project. So we could, the PAFA team that's in the room, could you raise your hand? And, 
and, and what I want to do, and just call a few people out if you don't mind, uh, and we can just at the end of the list, you can. I love affirmation. We can give them all a hand because they deserve it. Uh, but first, uh, I want to start with Dr. Anna Marley, our Chief of Curatorial Affairs. Uh, go ahead. Give a clap. Also, Jody Throff Morton. Jody is our former curator of contemporary art. Jody's not here. She's someplace in Wisconsin, Sheboygan, or something like that. And, you know, she's probably colder than we are, so that's okay. So I'm from the Midwest. But I think she has to be acknowledged because she was one of the brain trusts that really initially thought of this concept and, and, and birthed it along with DJ. So let's give her a hand. We have Juan Omar Rodriguez. Uh, Juan was a former curatorial fellow, put a lot of work into the chain. Our interim Rising Sun project manager. Nicola Singh, our current Rising Sun project curatorial fellow. Daniel Adams, our former assistant registrar. And our Director of Archives and Collections. Uh, Monica Zimmerman, our former uh, uh, Chief Education Officer. And you know, you don't, you don't get anywhere in this business or just in life in general without great people around you. And, and, and you might have heard a few or former, some are now, but we just really just appreciate everyone that put effort into this and want to make certain that they all were recognized tonight. But also I want to thank some other folks because a night like this doesn't happen with just us who do the work. We're important to it. But also that some of our closest friends and supporters uh, who made this exhibition possible. First I want to acknowledge the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, in particular Paula Marilyn Cola and uh, Kelly Schindler. Pew has been a partner all along here. As I said earlier, Paula made it very clear to me. Uh, she made it very clear to me, and I'm glad she did. I mean, I think, you know, I can't imagine, uh, you know, when you are in charge of resources and you want to see it, you want to see those resources amount to something, to, to, to manifest itself into something as so many worthy organizations who apply. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, also, uh, this wouldn't be possible, as I said earlier, without Jody and DJ's vision. So once again, thank you both for that. Um, and in a few minutes, you'll hear from Paula. She'll have an opportunity to speak, so I want to just make that clear. And there are a few other funders also who had supported this effort. Uh, that we definitely I love to show funders affirmation. So the William Penn Foundation. the National Endowment for the Arts. And also, we have some generous supporters who just people who love PAFA and they've been involved in the organization. So we got uh, Julie Jansen Bryan and Robert Bryan. Emily and Mike Cavanaugh. Roe and Martin King. And Howard Sachs, Dorothy and Ken Woodcock, Marianne Dean, the Longsworth Charitable Fund, Dr. J. Brian Murphy and his lovely wife Maggie, Sandy Norcross. I even have our anonymous donor. <laughs> and also our APAFA special exhibitions funds, those who contributed to that. Also, you know, when people often ask, how do you figure out what exhibits you're going to do and what works you're going to collect? Well, part of what happens is we have people who are part of committees and those committees have leadership. So I want to acknowledge our exhibitions committee leader, Brian Murphy. Give him a hand. Our collections 
committee leadership, uh, Emily Cavanaugh, <laughs> our board of trustees and our fearless leader, Ann McCullough. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone who is gathered here this evening and thank you for supporting both Hoffa and Amp uh, in this effort with Rising Sun. It is so, I, I mean, this I can't underscore enough. It is so important. We need your help to spread the word. Tell your friends, tell your family, even tell the people next door who you don't even like. <laughs> tell them they need to come out and see this exhibit. I think this dialogue in this moment in time in our history is so important. And I think that these artists, what they've done is just incredible. So please, please, please spread the word. Uh, also, uh, there are a number of really exciting programs associated at both institutions. I think there's a QR code that's flashing up here. If you put your phone on, you know how to work the QR code. It'll give you everything that's happening. There's a website dedicated, uh, uh, dedicated to uh, the show and what's happening and all that's going on. So at this point in time, I am going to ask Ms. Uh, Paula Maricola to come up and say a few words. Paula. Hi, everybody. Hello. 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 Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, indications to the contrary, I really am a nice person. <laughs> And uh, I'm really delighted to be here tonight again to celebrate part two of these amazing opening events for Rising Sun. It's really a movable feast. And um, before I go any further, for those who were there at AMP last night, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but um, anything worth saying is worth saying twice. At least that was how my mother uh, proceeded when we were growing up. <laughs> So, Rising Sun is a landmark collaboration between two of our most distinguished area organizations. And I want to warmly congratulate the museum leadership, uh, the museum, both museum CEOs, Eric and Ashley. They really ran with a ball that got dropped in their laps. Um, and the curators of the show, Judith and Duchesne, uh, all of the staff who worked so hard in both museums to make this a success tonight, and especially the participating artists, because without the artists, we have no reason to be here. Um, this is a signal achievement. For those who don't know us, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage is the cultural arm of the Pew Charitable Trust Philadelphia program. We're a grant maker dedicated to fostering a vibrant and diverse cultural ecology in the greater Philadelphia region. Rising Sun is a truly remarkable example of what our grants seek to make possible, an ambitious and substantive project that delivers inspiring and relevant cultural experiences to many communities. Um, it is an important dual exhibition that cogently demonstrates both institutions' commitment to excellence and to expanding their programmatic offerings in innovative ways by not only commissioning new work, but also giving artists unprecedented access to museum spaces by presenting multiple artistic perspectives on multiple platforms and by working toward building more equitable and inclusive museum spaces for artists and audiences. PAFA and AMP's joint efforts have created exciting opportunities to build relationships and deepen engagement with a broad range of publics through artistic work that considers and reflects timely questions around democracy, equality, and freedom of expression. And I said this last night, and I'm going to say it again. If you're paying any attention at all to what's going on in our country and in the world, it couldn't be more timely. Um, those efforts, the efforts of all of the team, are culminating. Uh, they culminated in last evening's events and are culminating tonight in these, I like to think of them as sibling exhibitions, that each amplify and ex 
expand, expand the impact and power of one another. So the whole is truly more than the sum of the parts, although the sum of the parts are pretty nifty. Um, I do hope that this kind of collaboration, if, if you'll indulge me for a moment, will serve as an inspiration to other organizations in our community. I think there are so many benefits um, for them and for the audiences in Philadelphia, the art lovers of Philadelphia, when organizations get together and share their expertise and resources. So don't be shy. I was also thinking last night as I was listening to everybody that philanthropy is really an act of faith and hope and trust, a lot of trust, and how gratifying it is when that faith and hope and trust is so amply rewarded. On behalf of the Pew Center and its staff, particularly our director of exhibitions and public interpretation, Kelly Schindler, where did you go? Oh, she changed her seat, um, who has shepherded, been responsible for shepherding this grant since 2020. It was made right as the pandemic hit. Um, so on behalf of all of us, I want to warmly applaud uh, AMP and PATHA for their courage, vision, and resilience in undertaking this partnership. The road was long, and um, as Eric alluded to in a humorous way, occasionally challenging, <laughs> but the results are indisputable, and they should make everyone concerned very proud. We certainly are, and it has been the Center's great pleasure and privilege to help make such a major project possible. So again, warmest congratulations to everyone across both institutions who work so hard uh, to bring us here tonight, and thank you, enjoy the evening. Our two curators uh, to introduce our panelists for today. So, okay. Judith and DeJay can come on up, please. Thank you. Right, thank you. Partner in crime. Uh, I'd like to say a few words before we introduce. Um, thank you. Um, and echoing what several others have said, I can't believe this night is finally here. <laughs> here we are. I came on board as the project curator a little more than a year ago, uh, after Jody Throckmorton, Papa's former curator of contemporary art, uh, left to take another position. Um, she had initiated the project um, and then brought, um, approached AMP, um, so she actually started in 2016. We we're going back seven years, amazing. And then um, DeJay has been involved since 2019. So I was the newcomer. Uh, when I was approached by Anna Marley, Papa's steadfast and talented chief of curatorial affairs, I understood that Rising Sun would be a very challenging and ambitious project. But I couldn't really know the scale and complexity until I was enmeshed in it. Um, it's been far more complicated, but also more rewarding than I could have anticipated. I'm grateful to have worked with a wonderful team at both AMP and PAFA. First and foremost, my amazing colleague, Dejay Duckett, Vice President of Curatorial Services at AMP, uh, who, as I said, is involvement, has gone back a number of years. Uh, there are far too many people to thank individually, but please know that I greatly admire and am indebted to you all. So. Thank you, especially. <laughs> Having lived through the culture wars in the late 1980s and early 90s, I was particularly drawn to issues about the current state of democracy and the unique role that art and artists can play in a democratic society. Whether the rising sun artists answer Franklin's question, is the sun rising or setting on the experiment of American democracy? or reflect on James Weldon Johnson's song that became the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Some of them answered directly, indirectly, subliminally, or not at all. Their projects provoke us to consider where the country is today and what we value about democracy, both as individuals and as members of a community. Their works emanate from their own lived experiences as immigrants themselves, or as children of immigrants, 
as descendants of enslaved people, as members of indigenous tribes, or as part of the baby boomer generation looking back at the past or ahead to the future. Is our democracy different today than it was during the culture wars 30 plus years ago in Franklin's day, when women and people of color couldn't vote? Uh, in many ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Um, what does seem constant is that artists have the courage to tackle difficult subjects and bring them to greater public attention. That artists continue to grapple with hard questions despite the undeniably decisive, uh, divisive, that's my word, divisive state of the country today, uh, provides at least a glimmer of hope for the future. Uh, a number of artists uh, in Rising Sun are with us this evening, as well as their dedicated representatives. We're grateful uh, to the gallerists and everybody else who supports the artists in their efforts. So, I'd like to recognize all of the artists by name individually, and please stand if you are here, if you're comfortable doing that. Not, um, Shiva Amadi. Shiva. Um, John Akamfra. LaVon Bell, Tiffany Chung, Lenka Clayton, Peter Coyne, <laughs> Peter, Peter was living at, uh, <laughs> in the building for three weeks, so we know she's here. <laughs> Mark Thomas Gibson, uh, Martha Jackson Jarvis, Demetrius Oliver, Amen or Hiron, who will be here. <laughs> Allison Saar, you think that was <laughs> Dred Scott. Uh, Rose B. Simpson. I know Rose is in New Mexico. Shada Soleimani. Shada. <laughs> Renee Stout. Hank Willis Thomas. Deanne Whitehawk, Deborah Willis, and Wilmer Wilson IV, and Sia Wolfa. So thank you, artists, all, for your ambition, your courage, and your vision. And thank you most for sharing your work with us. I'm really grateful. And now I would love if Dejay would like to say a few words and introduce tonight's speakers. Um, I'm, I'm going to be brief because I already said my piece last night. Um, and I also got to take a selfie with Peter Coyne and Allison Saar. So my job is done. I cannot talk that. Um, but I am overjoyed to be here witnessing this moment with you all. Thank you again to the Poppet team led by Eric Pryor. Um, back in 2019 when I learned the curatorial team would empty most of the work out of the historic building to make way for some of the leading contemporary artists of our time to reflect on our democracy, I was all in. What a moment to be able to see this transformative work at both of our institutions. I truly believe this exhibition will inspire visitors to join the discourse and maybe ultimately cause an atmospheric shift for the better in the social and political realm. Now, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers for the evening, Dr. Ashley Jordan, AKA Dr. J. She joined the African American Museum in Philadelphia as president and CEO in September of 2021. She most recently served as senior director of the development of development at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Ohio, and she brings significant experience managing and leading cultural institutions focused on memorializing and celebrating the African American experience in the United States. Other career mi milestones include serving as executive director of the Evansville African American Museum in Indiana and curator for the National Afro American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce, Ohio. Dr. Jordan earned her PhD in United States history at Howard University in Washington, DC, and an MA in public history from Howard University, and a BA at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. 
Dr. Jordan is the proud recipient of numerous professional and academic and civic awards, including the Pace Center Award from the, African, from the Association of African American Museums and the Black Excellence Award from the NAACP and multiple doctoral fellowships. Lastly, a most recent award that we are extremely proud and excited, uh, President Joe Biden announced his appointment of Dr. Jordan as a member for the National Museum, a board member um, of the National Museum and Library Services Board in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Iman Ore Iran is a multimedia artist currently <coughs> based in Los Angeles. He worked in figuration before developing his signature geometric abstract painting style. Ore Iran blends a wide range of visual influences, <coughs> including suprematism, Latin American concrete art, and geometric minimalism. He graduated from the San Francisco Art Institute in 1996. Received, received his MFA from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2006. Born and raised in Arizona, he also spent formative time in Mexico City, as well as in Huancayo and Lima, Peru. His solo exhibitions include um, Iman Oria Giron, Giron, Competing with Lightning, Nightshade at the Perez Art Museum in Miami, Florida, his work has been featured in group shows such as Soft Power at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Made in LA 2018 at the Hammer Museum, and something else, um, the Off uh, Biennial Cairo in 2015. His work is in the uh, permanent collections of the Hammer Museum, Los Angeles, the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, the Whitney Museum of Art, New York, to name just a few. Thank you so much for joining us, both of you. We're so excited to hear you this evening. So um, I went to college for journalism and mass communication, so thank you all for helping me live out one of the dreams that I did not do, um, that my dad started off paying for it, had to switch, but hey, it's college. <laughs> And then also I had a chance to talk with our artist featured here tonight, and he was sharing with me his story and all the good things he's done. And so for me, my interest is fashion. So I said, Iman, what are you wearing? And he was like, black. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> so we are ready in our black attire for this important conversation. I have my feather uh, sweater, but it got so hot up here that I was like, I gotta put it up there. I was gonna say something, but you know. Okay. But yeah, so after this, we'll take our picture and we will rip the runway for you all because right. you have black feathers and I have my black ensemble as well. So without further ado, you know, we'd rather hear from you and your viewpoint um, as it relates to this exhibition here going on right now, Rising Sun. And we just wanted to know a little bit more. Um, and our first question for this evening is, what is your process as an artist and how do you approach this particular problem? Um, you know, a lot of times... Uh, the work comes out of series, so right now this, um, these two pieces are part of a larger body that I believe these are number 15 and 14. Um, so in terms of like the formal approach, like I already kind of understand how that's going to be, but in terms of the prompt, um, what I was really interested in was this notion of the sun piercing the horizon. And for me, the question of, you know, the, the prompt brought up ideas of eternal time for me and perspective. And so for these, this, these works in particular, um, my approach was to think about entering the space, which is the incredible building next door, um, and to give the viewer a certain agency to uh, try to understand these two paintings as both the dawn and the dusk. So one of the pieces is called, uh, they're, they're, they're both from the Black Medallion series, and the Black Medallion series I started in, I guess it was 
God, what year are we in? <laughs> 2021, I think I started that, those pieces, and it, I was inspired by a De La Soul lyric that says, uh, black medallions, no gold. And so the, the pieces are related to a series called The Infinite Regress, in which the main form is, is painted with gold paint. And so I replaced the gold with black. And so to me, it was like, you know, bringing in the black medallions into this setting also kind of accentuated the idea of space and accentuated the idea of eternity. And like, for me, that blackness like represents infinity and like infinite possibilities. And so the viewer, I hope that they get this kind of perspective is like moving through the space, they're seeing the sunrise and the sunset and coming up with their own ideas about like what that means, you know, because I think the prompt, like my more cynical side is to be like, well, of course it was already set. You know what I mean? Like, uh, because so much of our history is troubled and complex and when Benjamin Franklin said it, it's like, you know, well, there were slaves crossing the Atlantic passage. There were native tribes here that had already lost all their land. So to me, like, you know, I, I, had, I had already kind of was thinking like what a, what a kind of frivolous quote, you know, but at the same time, like, to, but that's my more cynical side, you know, the more kind of considered side of me is like, well, it has to do with perspective. And, and my, my paintings a lot of times are about perspective, about reorienting the history of abstraction and reorienting people's uh, like perspective about what the potential for like geometry is you know so to me like that prompt in terms of the sun and this motif was exciting because it was also like this really clear moment in which um, a simple symbol could like spark so much like here we are 200 and some years after we're like talking about it excellent. Yeah. yeah excellent thank you for that yeah no problem um, leading into the next question um, what does democracy mean to you? And how did the concept of democracy inform your work on this project? Um, <sighs> democracy, <laughs> it means strength in institutions, honestly. Like, I don't think the individual in this day and age with the technology we've created has, like, as much power as maybe the individual did in other times. And so the institution has to be what buttresses people's freedom. And I think what we lived through in the Trump years was like a full on assault on that. And I think it's still happening, it's not over. But I think like what was promising was to see how certain, I think I always have a perspective too with like having had a lot of experience in Latin America and seen failed systems and those systems that, that institutions that don't have power to check things. And so you get a lot of dictatorships and you get like situations that Peru is going through right now where a revolving door of presidents, you know, six presidents in four years and and then it gets very manipulated by like the social media and stuff. But like, so to me, like my takeaway on democracy is like to, to buttress those systems to like withstand that. So, Cause the individual can only do so much, you know, the individual has always in the United States, especially like in the civil rights movement has had to like work within the system in order to make the bigger changes like the Supreme Court and things like that. You know? Excellent. We're moving along. <laughs> uh, again, I'm excited to see the piece. Um, just looking at your work um, and then having it now being on display here at the historic Papa building, what does that mean to you to have your work being shown at this location and at this time? Um, I just realized just now there's this painting behind me. <laughs> it took me a second to realize that. Um, you're probably all wondering what the hell, is, why is this painting? Um, so to connect it to, to that question, I 
was in a sh I had my first institutional solo show and my first solo show um, here at PAFA in 2005 with Alex Baker, who is over there. Alex had seen my work and and we really vibed and he was doing a lot of other curatorial work with West Coast artists and so he invited me to do this show here. Um, it was entitled Mirage and hopefully maybe there's still some brochures in some kind of archive somewhere. <laughs> some beautiful writing that Alex did on the work. But so the, the work was all the figurative work. Um, and so this piece, I believe, is, yeah, 2002. And this is my aunt and my cousin making umitas, which are like tamales. And if you see, they're kind of, they're, they're, the, the sweater, the cardigan that my aunt is wearing is actually based on like a choya cactus uh, skeleton. And then their clouds, their heads are kind of turning into mountains. And, um, so the work was a lot about kind of, uh, at that time was about the West and in a lot of ways ties into issues that are being approached in the Rising Sun in terms of like to me it was like kind of a critique of Manifest Destiny in a lot of ways like that would be the really blanket you know approach but then also like there's deeper layers to it that's more of a personal story about my family my experience and the things that I saw around me and in some ways kind of a pushback against like quote unquote like southwestern art you know um and so that was like to me the minute jody reached out to me i think it was like my first zoom meeting in the pandemic and um and i just immediately was like i know exactly what building you're talking i know exactly what space and she had proposed covering the benjamin west paintings and i was like Yes. <laughs> um, and so to me, it's like this strange relationship. You know, I came here too. My friend, my dear friend Karen is here. She's an art teacher here in Philly. I came here, when did it, when it was 2000? 99 or something when you were teaching? Right after that. Yeah, yeah. So she was. Yeah. And that was my introduction, my introduction to Philly. Yeah. yeah, and I volunteered with you for a week over at oh, were, that Freedom was, that School. Was yeah, that, that was a long time ago. But it was my introduction like to Philly. So, yeah, so to come to Philly to have this like this interesting relationship to Philadelphia was like, you know, super exciting to be able to like have started this one body of work. Or it wasn't the beginning of that body of work, but to have shown this important element of my practice in an earlier state and to have had some notion of what Philadelphia is like other than like the tourist spots or whatever to kind of know Philly on a little bit of a level like that but then also to then return with this new body of work it's not even new at this point but it's you know like almost 20 years since that show in 2005 so to me it was just like uh, a lot of emotions yeah and I think we feel your emotions through your work. Yeah. Um, I think also, too, we see a lot of your heritage mm -hmm. and your work. And I know a part of the theme is that the sun is never setting on democracy mm -hmm. in the world. And from your Latin heritage, the intersectionalities from your origins, your roots, how does that inspire you as an artist talking about democracy? Well, like I said earlier, like in that relationship that I have, like, so, I mean, the, the deeper side of things is like, like um, that relationship to democracy in, in Latin America is very fraught. Um, and I think that's a little bit of the origins of my relativism about it, you know, is, uh, and, but it, it's like not to be mistaken with apathy. Like I'm not an apathetic person, but I'm a bit more of like, I am skeptical, you know? And, and to me, like I thought of this idea of like, the dawn and the dusk are always thought of as like bookending the day, right? So, but in reality, they're not. They're actually liminal spaces, liminal times in which change is occurring. 
because we live on a ball and like the day is always somewhere for someone and the night is always somewhere for someone and so that kind of weird relativism can also eat it can either fill you with like some apathy but for me it's actually more of like hope you know because I think some of the darker times in the past two years three years um, since the that conversation with Jody um, which we all lived through which was also a really interesting fascinating thing to go through that like that we all went through the pandemic it wasn't just like oh it happened in New York or it happened in LA or happened. but um, is that uh, and Mark said something really beautiful last night about just like like after these big events you just kind of there's always that quiet weird moment where you just sit and you just go, well, what do we do now you know and like, like I felt like when he said that I was like that is exactly kind of that that relativism of like that moment in which you're just taking a survey of like what you're feeling and what you're seeing and then what your next step is going to be you know and so I think with like the, the way in which I work it's much different than like, actually, you know what, I just realized I'm supposed to flip through these. <laughs> <laughs> these are, this is also a piece that was in the show here at CAFA. Um, this is called Sueño Wamangino, and it is a dance in which they reenact kind of certain social uh, constructs of the, the Spanish Empire and the Spanish the, you see a guy in the center there wearing this like very fair skinned mask with the rosy cheeks mm -hmm. he, he plays the wealthy Spaniard and he's kind of uh, the vice royal and he is you know enacting kind of his rule over everybody mm -hmm. so it's this really I mean I could go on for a very long time about that but um, so this is a picture from the Morris Gallery from that show. Yeah, and there's Swinya Wamangu, you know, you can see there. Um, and then this is kind of transitioning into the, this is, you know, 10 years after that Morris Gallery show. And this is the more, the work where, where it started to kind of shift into ideas of abstraction, ideas of how abstraction can speak for a lot of things and so in terms of like it's it's doing it's doing the same thing but in a different way I think than the figurative thing. and so that I think that's like what you see in the work is is this conversation that's still very much present but spoken in a different way yeah. um, and this is part of the infinite regress series that I mentioned earlier about the goal in which this is, it's a bit hard to see here, it, it comes out a little bit more like yellow or okra, but that's actually gold paint. So, you know, these paintings actually change in the light and they have, you know, when there's light kind of raking across them, they resemble a bit more of like Incan jewelry, pre-Columbian jewelry and things like that. So that's where a lot of the forms kind of came out of. So this is Infinite Regress. This is that series that then the Black Medallion came out of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's that? Tell them what you had on last night. Oh, okay. I had a, uh, there's an artist from LA, Frohawk Two Feathers, uh, Umar Rashid. He did this amazing sweater that had like a cat with a lightning bolt shooting out of its eyes and on the back a snake and some old English. Yeah, and you immediately were like, Okay, yeah. hey, what are you wearing tomorrow night? <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is also the Infinite Regress series. Um, that is that gold. You can kind of see a bit more of the iridescence. Um, and these are the first works that are at the scale at which you'll see the pieces that are here in at the uh, museum. And um, and these actually are in New York. These are in Midtown, New York. So if you're walking around on Third Avenue, you might come across. Um, and so then this is the Black Medallion series and um, this is actually a piece that will be in a show tomorrow night at Fleischer Ullman Gallery here in Philadelphia so we kind of figured you know sync everything up while I'm here um, so you can see the form is is 
is totally related to the infinite regress. You have these circles in the center, and you have these kind of teardrop shape in the middle, and then everything kind of emanates in these different layers, and then you have this almost like a skirt dropping from, from the midsection down. Yeah. And so that quote from De La Soul, the, the black medallions, no gold, like to me, I really like the idea of like gold, when I was painting the gold works, you know, it, a lot of the thematics that came up was like about like reclaiming something, you know, because gold is the primary material that was like taken away from Peru and Mexico and throughout Latin America. And a lot of our forms, our most sacred forms were like melted down into coins. And so, like, I liked that idea of De La Soul, what De La Soul was saying there, because I'm definitely like an early 90s hip hop kid. And I, what I liked about that quote was like, kind of, they were all about the Daisy Age, and they were like replacing the, the bling that was going on at the time with the black medallion, you know? And to me, I like that idea of like replacing that value of like gold. So if, if the infinite regress was about this, like, you know, um, uh, investigation into gold, then the black medallion would be like replacing that value with black. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. Yeah, we'll end right there. Good. Well, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Manager's looking at us, and you know. Questions or no questions? Okay. Uh, I apologize at this point. I am going to get you over to the historic Langmark building so you can enjoy the show. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. You all know your way. You'll be going through the front door of the historic Landmark building on Broad Street. Uh, so we'll see you at the party next door.